because I have a browser that's saying it's doing something. So cool. Oh, wow. uh, boop, boop, boop. Are we live? Hi, everybody, and welcome to episode four, the season finale of So You Think You Can Tour Guide, the New York edition. Now, this is our very special Battle Royale, where the winners of the past three weeks will be competing head to head for the title of New York City's Best Tour Guide. Now, the rules are a little bit different today. I'll go over those in a second, but I will say that while each of these contestants has won their own individual prize leading up to today, they are not only competing for the title, they are competing for a hundred dollar visa gift card. So the heat is on, ladies and gentlemen. Now, um, I mentioned that the rules are going to be a little bit differently today, uh, or different today. Uh, instead of eliminating any of our contestants after round one, we will be taking a overall total score from both rounds. Now at the end of each round, both round one and round two, uh, there will be a chance for uh, the tour guides to win some additional points based on a very difficult slide uh, from each of the themes that we're going to present. Now, before I kind of get into uh, the background of what we're going to be celebrating and talking about today, I do want to introduce my fabulous judges. Uh, so please welcome her all the way from San Francisco. It's Miss Dara Mahali. Hey, yo. Oh, man, this is exciting. It's our fourth episode. I hope you guys bring it. We're going to be extra ridiculous today. I know that uh, it's time for us to have some fun. So thank you again for showing up. You guys are awesome. Fantastic. Thank you, Dara. Well, uh, next up is an OG legend uh, in the experience first world. Uh, Mr. Thomas Minetti, are you in Connecticut right now? Actually, I am right now coming at you from Manhattan. So take me back to Manhattan, that dear old dirty town. <laughs> and we are so glad to have you. Happy Pride, Tom Simonetti. Oh, I can't wait. Oh my goodness. And last but certainly not least, and I believe she's in Texas, she can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, it's Miss Val Williams. Say hi to everybody. Oh, hello everyone. I'm coming to you from Austin, Texas, and I cannot possibly outdo that last introduction. So I'll just say hi from me and my virtual background. Fantastic. Well, greetings from Little Italy. Uh, it's San Gennaro here on the live stream today. Um, now, we have three fantastic contestants. You've seen them before. Uh, they are the winners of the past three weeks. So in order, uh, I'm going to go ahead and welcome them. Uh, and then we'll move on with today's competition. So first and foremost, uh, hi, Jen. Uh, welcome back. Uh, you won round one uh, in the competition here. Um, have you been watching along as the competition has continued? Yes, I have. I, uh, I did actually miss uh, the very beginning part of week two, but I saw all of the others and uh, fierce competition. I'm very nervous today, like Fantastic. nervous as having to step out on stage and, and perform again. So I'm very excited. Oh, good. Well, we're excited to have you. And there's no need to be nervous. Uh, you are all fantastic guides. And uh, today's a very special episode. So um, we're excited to have you back. Now, next up is the winner of week two. Uh, it's Miss Helen. Helen, how are you doing? I'm doing very good, thank you. Fantastic. Now, do you feel the heat? Do you feel, uh, did you go back and watch Jen and Jason's episodes? I did not because I want to stay under the illusion that, you know, I'm far superior, which of course I know I'm not, but you know, the and illusion I, for now will sustain me. I, I, I would do the same thing, Helen. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and last but certainly not least is the winner of last week's challenge, uh, Mr. Jason, how are you doing today? I'm, uh, I'm okay. I'm coming down from a fever, actually. <laughs> oh, well, what kind of fever okay. is it? Do you, do you, have you been checked for? Um, that's, that's on tomorrow's radar, but I think it was a heat stroke yesterday or heat exhaustion. Okay. Okay. Well, um, uh, please take it easy. Uh, we <laughs> yeah, don't mean to scare anyone. Too hard. And uh, we are all uh, thinking about you and hope that uh, whatever you find out tomorrow is Positive news and not positive the other way. Uh, so <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, um, there is uh, a lot going on in the world right now, especially New York City, uh, which is the city that we love um, and we are celebrating. Um, the death of George Floyd uh, has sparked protests and riots all over, not just the United States of America, but all over the world. Uh, and as I mentioned last week, um, of course, <laughs> those protests and uh, I wouldn't even say they've been riots. I've actually heard from most people, they've been quite peaceful um, other than, you know, some pushing back about the curfew, but we have a lot of history. New Yorkers don't like to be told when they can't leave their apartments. Um, and that's been the case for hundreds of years. Uh, 
Yeah, New York has been a leader in a lot of these movements. And like I said last week, uh, we love a good protest. Now today I am enjoying a cocktail. It's a Tom Collins. Uh, Tom Collins happens to be a character from a Broadway musical called Rent. Uh, and Rent is a politically charged, prolific uh, musical about New York City uh, that shed light on kind of the gentrification that began happening in a lot of artists' neighborhoods in the 1980s. And it all set against the AIDS pandemic. Um, so uh, that kind of leads into kind of where we're going on today's episode. Our first round, our first theme, ladies and gentlemen, um, in light of what's going on in New York City um, uh, regarding the George Floyd protest, uh, there have been a lot of social uprisings in the history of New York, okay? And they have dated back all the way back to the American Revolution uh, to this very day. So today we are going to be taking a look at some of the famous, I'm going to put this drink down for a moment, um, some of the famous historical uprisings that have happened through history. Now I do want to say each of the uprisings that will be talked about uh, in this competition are actually featured in the tours at Experience First. Um, so each one of these, if you were to come to New York City and take our various tours, you would actually hear about these uh, uprisings from our guides themselves. So uh, it's not brand new for the competition. So that means competitors, you probably should know some of these things. Now, first round, we are going in the order of how these competitors were brought to us. So Jen, you are up first. Are you ready to see what social uprising you will be speaking about today? Yeah. Fantastic. Now, I will show you the slide, and I will also tell you the name of the uprising and the year that it took place. But from there, you are on your own with two minutes on the clock, okay? So I'm gonna go mm -hmm. ahead and get that ready for you just right now. Fantastic, okay. So are you ready to see your uprising? Bring it on. Bring it on. So this is a picture famously of the Stonewall riots, which took place in 1960. Nine. Now I have put two minutes on the clock here, Jen. Uh, when you are ready, we will go ahead and begin. Are you good? Yes. Fantastic. Here we go. So we are standing here uh, looking at this amazing picture of uh, really part of the Stonewall riots. Uh, there's also been, where it's been reading kind of Stonewall uprising as well. This really kind of stems, well, not really, it did stem uh, June 28th. 1969. Now, in the 1960s, it was illegal to serve a drink to anyone that you knew was gay. So there were um, places that the gays couldn't go, but then there were places that they could go. And a lot of these were bars that were almost kind of like speakeasies, in a sense, if you really think of it for, for the gay, gay culture. And uh, this one here was in Greenwich Village, Stonewall on Christopher Street. And uh, what ended up happening was that when the gays were able to go to these clubs and they're having their drinks or they're trying to congregate and uh, socialize, then what would happen is cops would raid a lot of these places. So um, they would go in and they would take you um, into the bathroom. They'd have you pull out your license. They would check to see what sex you were. And then they would check to make sure that you were the sex that your license said that you were. Um, this is absolutely an awful thing that would happen, um, but it was what they were used to. And on one particular night, a few nights before January 28th, there was a raid. And as the cops were leaving, they heard the bartender say, that's all right, we'll be open again in a couple of days. And uh, the police officer got upset and realized, well, fine, I'm going to come back and come again. And so on June 28th, um, in the early hours of the morning, they came and raided the Stonewall Inn again. And this was that moment where the gay culture got tired and said, that's it. I'm not going to do it anymore. And that was my <laughs> two minutes. Fantastic. You were at two minutes. Yes. But All right. uh, things have changed a little bit from your week. Uh, so we did get a little bit less time in there. But each of our judges is going to be able to ask you a question. So we'll start with the order that I introduced the judges in today. Uh, so Dara, uh, go ahead and ask Jen a question about the Stonewall Uprising. Hi, Jen. Uh, it's nice to hear you talk about that. Um, 
there's a lot to think about there and unpack. So I guess I'm going to go a little more lighthearted and um, ask what, what particular involvement have you had um, within Stonewall, the location of that bar? Where is it? Have you hung out there? Are you, you know, part of that scene? Um, I am an ally and um, I have not been inside Stonewall, but I have been past there many times. Um, it's th right across from it. There's the, uh, the park that has the gay liberation statues, which ironically, when they were first created, uh, New York said that they were too controversial. And so they went to Wisconsin, which really kind of blows my mind. Uh, then they have been now brought back here to New York. But um, I have a sister that uh, came out a few years ago. And um, I, funnily enough, last year or this past year, celebrating the 50 year anniversary, I you know, texted her and said, hey, happy, happy Pride Day and happy 50th anniversary. And she's like, I'm such a bad gay because I don't know any of that. And I'm like, girl, let me school you on your history. <laughs> so, oh, there's so um, much learning out there. Uh, yeah. Thank you for you know, helping to, you know, tell that story. I appreciate it. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Dara. All right, next up, Tom, which question do you have about the story? So, yeah. So Jason ha had this last last week. So good job, Jason, by the way. Um, and good job, Jen. Um, so my question is, with that beautiful picture that you showed us, um, there is a beautiful African-American woman um, in there. Can you tell me maybe who she is? Uh, can I see the picture again? If I remember correctly, sure. you can. Mm -hmm. uh, if I remember correctly, that is the drag queen that actually was the first to like really stand and and say no. Um, mm -hmm. And this, it's like I said, it's this is that first time that you see uh, the gay society just rallied together as opposed to just sitting down and taking it. It was like, no, mm -hmm. we will not do this anymore. And I love that moment. And that's what I love about Greenwich Village as well, because you see that time and time again, that you get um, a congregation of people, uh, of a, a community of people that no longer will take it and decide to stand up for themselves. And then we all rally behind because we all believe in them as well. That's great. Oh yeah, Marsha P. Um, uh, Johnson is her name, and it's actually um, she is a trans woman. Uh, she's a transgendered woman too, as well. So that okay. uh, see him there. But again, like you said, um, and I think you said it perfectly. It was the one time that we're like, we're not going to take it, um, which is really great. So thank you so much, Jen. That was great. Thank. You. Thank you, Tom. Now, last but certainly not least, Miss Val, what question do you have about the Stonewall uprising? Yes. Hi, Jen. Thank you for that Hi. awesome information. Um, so my question is. Under whose control was the Stonewall Bar at the time that this riot uh, uprising, sometimes called a riot, took place? Under whose control, like who was like running the bar? Owned, yeah, who owned the bar? Usually the mob, because they, uh, they have the, like they were the ones that had those speakeasies. They knew how to illegally get their stuff in. And a lot of times it would be, once they were closed down, then there'd be, you know, all the bottles be broken, there'd be a van down the street, they'd be like, hey, bring it all in, and more stuff would come in. So um, you gotta, you gotta love the mob for knowing how to get around all that. <laughs> that aspect. They, uh, and it was kind of like they were making their money. So they didn't care who they were supplying their drinks to. As yes. long as they made their money. Yeah, that's correct. It totally was the mob. And I've always found that interesting. Um, because it speaks to the connection between the connections that existed between the New York City Police Department and the mafia at the time and what would be allowed and not allowed and who decides when it's allowed or not allowed or not allowed anymore. And uh, yeah, Marcia, Marcia, it is said that Marcia P. Johnson threw the first punch and I love that story. Fantastic. Yeah. Good job, Jen. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, judges, and thank you, Jen. All right, our next contestant is Miss Helen, winner of week two. Are you ready to see your social uprising? Yes, I am ready. Fantastic. So I'm going to pull it up so you can take a look. Like I said before, I will tell you the name of the uprising and the year. Now, this is the New York shirtwaist strike 
of 1909. Now, Helen, take a look at it. I've got two minutes on the clock. Let me know when you're ready. Mm -hmm. Okay, and here we go. So this is a strike from 1909. You can see that these are mainly women, young women. Um, and so these represent uh, uh, women who were working in the garment industry at the time, uh, which was uh, one of the main uh, industries. They were uh, most of the time very young women or you know, girls, we would say this day, who were immigrants. Uh, and that's interesting. They were trying to unionize. Uh, and one of the reasons they wanted to unionize is to, uh, um, as they had a lot of complaints about the work condition. Uh, and people were paid very low wages, they were day workers, they were working in sweatsh what we would call sweatshops today, pretty much. Uh, and so this leads to its prefiguration of what happened in 1911 uh, in Greenwich Village. Uh, there was a short West Triangle uh, 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 factory, garment factory, where some of these women may have worked. And on that day, on the 25th of March, a huge fire uh, broke up uh, and it killed 146 people, mainly women. Uh, and uh, because of the scandal that uh, it was uh, uh, public, uh, the press was there, people were there, young women jumped uh, to their desks out of the window of the Triangle Shirt West factory, um, and so uh, in front of people. Um, and because there were no proper fire exits, uh, these ladies were working in very uh, difficult conditions with no ventilation, a lot of flint around, um, so very prone to fires, the floors were very high, so a fire department truck could not access them. Um, and so all uh, of these uh, basically uh, uh, pushed, uh, because of public opinion, 100, more than 100,000 people uh, came to the wake uh, uh, for these workers. It, from, it pushed unionization and all the laws of safe labor, pretty much that these ladies uh, were you know, uh, asking for. I think I'm over. I can continue, but I think I'm over, Bob. Yeah, sorry, I put on mute because I was worried. There was noise. Oh, there's still noise. Oh my goodness. Noise in my apartment. All right, that was fantastic. So we are gonna go backwards this time. So Val, you are first up. Um, which question do you have for Helen about the New York shirtwaist strike of 1909? Helen, um, why do they say that the doors had been locked? Uh, on these women at the time of the fire? So for the uh, Short West Factory fires, they, they have been blocked. I think they were blocked by um, old uh, sewing machines that were very heavy at the time by the owners uh, to stop ladies from going out to have a break, uh, potentially a smoking break. And we actually believe that that particular fire, uh, which is one of the main landmarks, is the, the, the deadliest industrial uh, uh, accident in New York history um, was started by a cigarette that was lit pretty much and because there was a lot of lint you know and fabrics pieces around uh, that was it and so basically the owners uh, were stopping and also to stop so if they were stopping the ladies to go out you know have a little break and chat and stuff like that they were stopping union you know maybe uh, agitators uh, to try to come in and talk to the ladies like the people we saw on the on the picture so it was a burst way thing. They had a little fire escape that was like tiny and it collapsed. You know, it was not what would be too norm these days. And it collapsed after a few people tried to escape to this way. So after that, people were trapped because, I mean, there was like an escalator, but uh, elevator that collapsed as well, you know, very soon. And so because the doors were locked to, you know, not allow people from the outside to come and unionize and stopping the ladies from taking a break, the ladies were trapped in and burn a light. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you, Val. Well, next up, in the middle again, I promise this won't be the case next round, uh, is Mr. Tom. Which question do you have about the New York? Hi, so thank you so, 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 so much for that. Um, it's uh, such an interesting story, especially because so many of those girls were Jewish women and Italian women, and I'm, as you can tell by my hairy chest, Italian. Um, but, uh, right? I'm sorry. Oh, no, all, and, and also, you know, me. Um, but anyways, um, my question is, what was the youngest, you know, you said girls and women, you, you interchanged. What was the youngest um, that probably passed away? So I'm not sure exactly, but I know that most of, so the hundred and, uh, out of the 146, I see 123 were ladies. Uh, most mm -hmm. of them teenagers. When we say ladies, you know, people, uh, children mm -hmm. were working starting age five. 
you know, at the time. Yeah. You know, the labor laws, there, I think 50 labor laws came out of that event, mm -hmm. you know, within a year like this. Uh, was one of the main things was uh, uh, to re try to regulate uh, children labor at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, so I, I would say 14, you know, maybe like, you know, early, You're correct. you know, most of them went between 14 and 20, I would say something like mm -hmm. that. So You're correct. Yep. Time, normal, you know, they were young immigrants, you know, ladies. Yeah. Yep. No, you're correct. 14 is right. 14 is right. Yeah, it does, but it would be in that range. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. And last but certainly not least, Ms. Dara. Helene, I'm so sad I never took one of your tours in person, and I intend to change that someday eventually. Um, but for now, I wonder, is there a specific person uh, in that, that the story that you want to talk about any names come to mind any champions heroes that you want to highlight for us uh, I do not remember the names um, specifically um, but I know talking about names uh, so full disclosure I used to live uh, in the village across from the site of the fire I could yeah. see from the window because I work for NYU Medical Center. I work for NYU and now the building is still exists. It's the gray building of uh, New York University where they have the biology labs. <laughs> so I've been in there. And I did not know coming from Europe. You don't know, I was like, and so every year on the 25th of March, I was seeing silly people leaving flowers on the pavement. And then there's a plaque, you know, I had not read the plaque. So what they do is they do it every year. And then there's bigger, big, big uh, um, celebration when it's the centennial or, you know, like uh, 10 years. But every year there is a, an association that celebrates the ladies who died. Sometimes they impersonate the people when they have bigger demonstration. They dress like them, them and they wear their names. So we know the names of all the people uh, who actually died a day. And they put flowers. So they line up flowers on the pavements and around each flower, there's a little label with the name of each person, pretty much. So they, they lied on 136, you know, flowers. Nice. Um, and then I know there were famous leaders, you know, of women's union and, and women's, but I don't remember the name. So I don't, I, don't, I, don't know, what I know, I, yeah, I'm not sure it's true. So I was like, okay, <laughs> what I know is that after this fire happened, it was ripe for, you know, there'd been events and, and uh, uh, demonstration, you know, for years, uh, people were so outraged. Uh, but, you know, like the ladies were burned to the point that people could not recognize them. Sure, no, I, I learned about that in college. And when the day of the, and also the, the it was like a process, a procession, you know, and it was raining like hell that day. You can see pictures, uh, like hundreds, like thousands and thousands and thousands of people who had no, didn't know the ladies lined up the streets of New York and stuff like that. And I can have a tidbit more. The owners of the, the shop, I think Harry's was the name of the guy. It was two guys. They went to judgment, but they were acquitted. Not because they denied the facts, not at all. It's because there were no laws to protect, so they did nothing wrong. And so people were so outraged by that. And then they went to civil judgment and they had to pay $75 per, per death. Even wow. the time was not that much, right? And so people were so outraged and now it pushed forward, you know. And so they had now commission that, that visited every single garment, you know, uh, site in New York City. Like yeah. visit and probably get a lot of it. I think I, I know. I know. We could talk about this, uh, and we should. We should talk about this larger and at length. I learned about this in college, and uh, I was really moved when I took this tour. Um, and I heard about it, and I saw it for the first time. It was, it was, it was moving. And so, thank you for sharing that story. Um, if you guys don't know about it, the audience, you should, you should research it because it's pretty interesting. Thank you, Helene. Absolutely, thank you, Dara. And while the judges, if they have to make any last minute score adjustments, I'll just say this. Um, Helen was very clear and concise uh, in her description, uh, but I wanna drive home a point. Uh, if you like having weekends off, getting paid overtime, having vacation, sick pay, it's because of these women in New York City. So uh, the next time you enjoy your vacation or having days off every week, 
Remember that a woman fought for that for you. So um, I also will say, I don't have a cocktail for it, uh, but I like to tie everything back to musical theater. Uh, there is a musical about the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire. I didn't see it, but it played off Broadway. Uh, but if you want to learn about the horrors of child labor, log into Disney Plus and you can watch either the movie version or the Broadway version of Newsies, which is about the Newsboys strike of 1899. So check it out. Christian Bale is in it and he sings and dances. So there you go. All right, Jason. Great. And that too. Uh, now, speaking of newsboys, I don't think you're a newsboy, but you are the boy competitor here today. Uh, are you ready for your social uprising? I'm as ready as I'll ever be. Fantastic. All right. So I'm going to show it to you. Like I said before, I'm going to tell you the name of it and the year that it took place. Uh, so here we go. This is Occupy Wall Street. It took place in 2011. Um, I'm going to put two minutes on the clock. Let me know when you're ready, okay? <laughs> okay, I'm ready. Okay. Here we go. All right. So um, Occupy Wall Street was a movement where people were protesting the wealth disparity between Wall Street bankers who own, I think, like one, it's like one percent of the um, population owes ninety percent of the wealth, some something like that. Um, and uh, Tom, your, your timer, or sorry, Bobby, your timer went um, out. Um, but there it is. Um, the uh, so um, there was um, a lot of concern about how the Wall Street bankers weren't doing a lot to uh, share the wealth. There's a lot of disparity within New York City itself. And so people just said, you know what, we're going to try to occupy Wall Street until the bankers and um, the executives and the people, you know, the 1% elites um, would start to, you know, share the wealth a little bit more and uh, maybe stop, you know, the, the big conglomerates, like there's like six media conglomerates that own all the media in the US. There's a lot of monopolies that have gone unchecked. And also I think that a lot of these Wall Street bankers were responsible for the housing crisis um, in the mid 2000s, like the early 2000s, mid 2000s. Um, and that's about all I know about that. <laughs> I don't know as much as I should. <laughs> well, fantastic. Well. You still have a chance uh, okay. with the questions that our judges are going to ask. Uh, so we are going to start this time, starting with Mr. Tom. Uh, do you have any questions for Jason regarding Occupy Wall Street uh, and any of the things that it represents? I do. What's really cool about um, not about um, talking about this is that it is um, on our 9/11 uh, tour is where is usually where this is kind of hit on hit upon before we go into the actual. Um, 9-11 uh, Memorial. So, uh, and I do remember this because I was living downtown at the time that this was all going on. Uh, so my question is, is do you remember what the park was called at the time so that if somebody wanted to go down to see where this was? And number two, what is the park called now? Um, you hate me and I love it. To be honest with you, I don't know because I think I was in high school when this was happening. Great. <laughs> far, far um, <laughs> no problem. So, it, no, it's, it's all good. Um, so, um, it's Zuccotti Park is what it was called at the time. And now it's called One Liberty Plaza. It was renamed, of course, um, because that was also where a lot, that park was actually where a lot of um, places were set up uh, for people to either donate blood during 9-11 um, or uh, to kind of go and find out about family members, et cetera, right down there. So, uh, it's been a staging ground for a few different things. So yeah, it's either Zuccotti Park or it's uh, One Liberty Plot. Really cool. Good job. Thank cool. you, Tom. Awesome. Uh, well, next up is Dara. Oh, she was shocked that I called on her. Unmute. Oh, man. Okay, no, I have my question. I'm so excited to ask this question because this is my favorite part about Wall Street. Jason, what are your thoughts on the Fearless Girl statue? I, I've never seen it. I don't know what it is. <gasps> Fail. Oh my God. Uh, fearless yeah. girl. I'm just going to be honest on. today. <laughs> That's good. I appreciate that. And I know you've got the fever, so you'll get a little pass there. But Fearless okay. Girl is the statue standing up to the bull. And they moved her in front of the New York Stock Exchange. So interpret that as you will. Um, I'm really glad that she's there. She was also meant yeah, to be that sounds like cool. art installation, but then was made permanent. Yeah, she was. Fantastic. I have seen it actually. I just didn't know what she was. Yeah, oh. it's really cool <laughs> now you know. 
Amen. Well, no, but that's the point of this show. You know, uh, things right. are a little bit tougher this week. And I promise you the next round is going to be even tougher, ladies and gentlemen. Um, but that's why everyone gets to stay. Uh, and we have bonus points available. Um, but it's meant to educate not only uh, the, the contestants and judges, but all of our viewers, ladies and gentlemen. So um, uh, thank you all for participating uh, and continuing these conversations. And uh, that's one of the most magical things, I think, about being a tour guide is uh, you know what you learn. Uh, and obviously your tours adapt as you meet people uh, and you learn more stories. Um, no two tours are the same. Uh, if they are, you're probably at Disneyland. And um, uh, even that, <laughs> uh, the Jungle Cruise, uh, no two Jungle Cruise skippers are the same because certain jokes land and certain jokes don't. And that's why I was hired for this company because apparently I sound like one. Uh, so ladies- did... Wait, no, Val needs to ask. It's... I know. I'm, I'm... Oh, okay, all right, all right. <laughs> and last, but certainly not least, is Val. <laughs> what question do you have uh, for Jason about uh, Occupy Wall Street, income disparity in the United States, um, uh, all the things? It can, be, it can be an overarching question. Yeah. So my question is with regards to how the Occupy Wall Street um, protests influenced um, the Department of Homeland Security and anything you or any of us might know about that. There is something that came out of those protests with regards to DHS that is interesting slash troubling to many. I am drawing a blank. I hope that the disparity becomes more equal in the future though. No worries. As you said, you were also in high school at this time. Yeah. It's just making me feel old, so thanks for that. Sorry. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> I was in New York City at the time, but I will admit that I honestly didn't know as much about it as I should have even then. And this was a big awakening for me and very eye-opening. Um, I lived in New York City in 2008 when the housing bubble burst and that crisis happened. But as someone who was liver living at the time pretty much around the poverty line, I actually didn't feel huge changes in my life um, as a result but at the same time was very sympathetic and understanding because trying to live in New York City on uh, very small dollars is a large challenge. Um, so these protests were something that really woke me up to, hey, what the heck is going on? Why do I see so many people here? I'm heading to my temp job. What's going on over there? And that's the point of protests and uprisings, right? Like if you're not paying attention, maybe you'll pay attention now. And it helped to wake me up for sure. Um, to answer the uh, Homeland Security thing, um, what I had learned was that they began surveillance on protesters. So we talk about technology with regards to civil liberties and the use of that to protect us, but when does it become a problem? And a lot of people were really against the use of technology to surveil protesters. And even right now um, with what's going on around the country, the uprisings, a lot of people have said, turn off your phone location services, you know, because our law enforcement can use these elements of surveillance to track or, and to inform as well. You know, we use them for good to protect our country, but then when is the line crossed? What's problematic? And so there was a lot of discussion that came out of this because people realized that technology was being able to, being used to um, keep an eye on protesters and agitators of the Occupy Wall Street movement. So just thought that was, Interesting. Hmm. Which very yeah. interesting, and I remember that at the time uh, we were reading 1984, and so I think that that was like the theme that they were trying to tie in with uh, the modern uh, current events of the time. And uh, although I don't know much about Occupy Wall Street, it was definitely good to see people having their voices heard out there on the news. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Great, great questions that are brought up with that too. Uh, 1984. That is a big theme within 1984. Um, I recently, actually a few years ago, saw a production of it in Pittsburgh being done and they've chosen, I, I'm like Bobby as well, I like to tie everything to theater, welcome. <laughs> welcome. You know, they've chosen to use these large screens as displays throughout the production and mm. there was often a booming voiceover as well. And it's that big brother concept of if mm. everything is being watched all the time, how do, does that influence us? How do we change our actions and our choices mm what we say and don't say when we know we're being watched. Yeah. 1984, read it. Um, so Val, you uh, basically read my mind because we are going to segue in the round 
one bonus. Now you have the opportunity to win an additional two points, okay? There are two questions to be asked. Now, in order to do this, I need to give everyone a fair playing field. So what will happen is I'm going to show you a slide and I'm not going to tell you what the name of this uprising was. That's the first question, uh, is which one of the three of you can chime in first uh, and let me know. Now, to make it fair, I will show the image. We will go back uh, to this uh, view where everyone can see. I do need my judges uh, to be watching to make sure that I pick the right person who raises their hand. Uh, so I need all three of my contestants to right now show me that you can raise my hand when I tell you, oh no, Jason disappeared. Hey. Oh, no, he's right there. It just moved. What is going on here? Okay, <laughs> on the count of three, I need to make sure that you all can raise your hand and hear me. So one, two, three. Fantastic, okay. So you're only gonna raise your hand when I prompt the person who knows the name of this uprising, which is the first question. Now I will have a second question to ask. Uh, if you get the first question correct, you will be able to answer that question. Uh, if you get it wrong, uh, it will go to the remaining two guides to see if they can find the answer for me, okay? Each question is worth one additional point from round one. Now, uh, the reason I said value read my mind is because I tie everything back to theater. That is the only clue that I'm going to give you about this famous New York City uprising. So contestants, remember, I'm going to show the image, let it sit for just a couple seconds, uh, and then we'll come back to this gallery view. Okay. You guys got it? One, two, three. Fantastic. So here we go. This is your uprising. Take a look, just a couple seconds. All right, we are going back to the group. Now on the count of three, ladies and gentlemen, I am going to ask you, and this right now is the name, official name, you don't get bonus points for knowing the year, but the official name of this famous New York City uprising. Oh, I didn't say yet. Len is ready, oh my goodness. Okay, so it's gonna be on the count of three. One, two, three. Okay, who was it? Who was it? Honestly, I feel like yeah. hand appeared sooner. That's rough. I'm gonna let you guys make that call. Looks like a tie to me. Okay, so uh, there are two bonus. I mean... oh. <laughs> yeah, Tom Simonetti, you're the tiebreaker. I'm the tiebreaker. I'm the tiebreaker. Yeah, um, you are. Let's go. You know, I will say that I did see um, Jen's hand go flying up, but literally, Helene, you were like this close by. Well, you know what? Here's how I'm going to do it then. Uh, Jen, you will get asked the first question, and Helene, you will get asked the second. So, Jen. Perfect. I like that. As it's a tie, you will each have an equal opportunity on your own uh, to answer. So, Jen, what is the name of this uprising? After Place Riot. Fantastic, one extra point for Jen. Now, uh, Helen, on the second part of the question, and again, you have free reign to answer it without any competition, uh, which famous play were these protesters writing against? I know it's a Shakespearean play, because they were they're both, the two actors, MacReady and um, who, I don't remember his name, Hoover or something like that. Edwin Booth, it's all good. Booth. Sorry, we're uh, fighting to see, we're fighting, yeah, uh, who was the best Shakespearean actor of the time. And then people took sides. And so I'm, I don't remember which play. I can say, you know, the play that doesn't, you know, name his name, you know, or, you know, I don't remember. Sorry? Yes? You're so, right. The, you're almost there. Yeah. I Mackers, we name. call it. We call it the Scottish play. <laughs> The Scottish play, voila, the Scottish play, because we shall not say it. It's not, we're not in a theater, but kind of feel we are. Yeah. All right, well, actually fantastic. So Helen, you also ran an additional point for round one, okay? Uh, so congratulations, ladies and gentlemen. Just to tell the viewers, that is the Astor Place Riots. And I'm actually gonna let Tom tell the story uh, because um, I know he loves this one. So there you go. So no, it's it's a good story. And I will say, um, Helen did a wonderful job of telling you what it was. It was because of, I'm gonna say it, Macbeth. I don't know if you guys know this, but in the theater, you're not allowed to say it because if you do say it, um, all anything could go wrong. People have actually died during the show. Sandbags have fallen down. So instead you say, um, everybody, what do we say instead? My theater people, we say, break a leg is what we say instead of, um, instead of uh, good luck in the theater too. We have a lot of superstitions. What's cool about the after place riots? Well, not cool about it, but it was the first time that the National Guard was actually called out. Um, and it ended up because, uh, and it ended up in being what 
got New York City to start the New York City Police Department. Yes, because of theater and because of Broadway, that's how the New York City Police Department came about, is what it did, because of us people. Um, so whatever you do when next time you're in a theater, do not say the word uh, Macbeth. You will be asked to probably turn around three times, walk outside of the theater, and come back and apologize to everybody. So good luck. Oh, break a leg. Well, thank you, Tom. Um, like I said, today is all about keeping uh, in line with, with current events. And um, uh, while these are not directly the same as what's happening in New York City with George Floyd, um, they are precursors. Uh, and some of the ancestral fights that New Yorkers have um, taken over the years uh, to uh, prove themselves and prove their worth in a city that can be very difficult to be living in. Um, Great, I can add the points to what she did. Wonderful, I will make sure that I do that. Now I do wanna go into round two. Um, now this, I'm, it's gonna take a second to get there, so bear with me, ladies and gentlemen. Um, okay, one, uh, AJ, do you wanna go ahead and do this or do you want me to go ahead and, um, uh, I'm gonna introduce it first and then uh, AJ is gonna say something. So uh, let me just go into it. Um, as you all know, uh, New York City is famous for the movies that have been filmed here. Um, fun fact to everyone watching and maybe to our panel uh, is that uh, New York City is the most filmed city in the world. Awesome, so many movies, TV shows, commercials, etc., have been filmed uh, in New York over the years that it is the most filmed city on the planet. Now, it may be shocking to some people that some of the most politically charged films in history that have been filmed in New York are actually pieces of musical theater. I've mentioned two of them so far, uh, Rent about the gentrification and AIDS crisis. Um, I've mentioned Newsies, which was about the uh, newsboy strike of 1899. Another famous one that I didn't get to jam into this episode is Hair, uh, ladies and gentlemen, which was about uh, counterculture, uh, protests against the Vietnam, free love, the hippie movement. But I would have to say that the most politically charged movie uh, that has ever been filmed in New York, and you might laugh at this, uh, is probably The Wiz starring Diana Ross and Michael Jackson. Now, the reason I say this, ladies and gentlemen, is because The Wiz as a Broadway show in a movie attempted to do something uh, so groundbreaking that I think even today, it's really hard to wrap your head around. Um, in the theater, uh, there is often a push about um, trying to, to bring multicultural voices into shows, multicultural and diverse cast to show. Uh, and in the 70s, they decided to do that with The Wizard of Oz. Now, instead of just putting a black cast in the classic 1930s MGM musical, uh, they didn't just put a black cast on stage. They took the entire story, which is one of the few American fairy tales that exist, Dorothy, Kansas girl, you know, tornado goes to this magical land. Um, it is an American fairy tale. They took that and they completely rewrote the story, completely rewrote the score uh, and told it through the lens of what it would be like to be uh, a black American. Uh, and the movie took it even farther because instead of being from Kansas, uh, Dorothy is from Harlem. Uh, and not only is she from Harlem, when she goes to Oz, it is not a mythical far off land. It is an idealistic, and also um, post-apocalyptic New York City. Unprecedentedly, that movie was shot on location all over New York in a way that they could never do in 2020. I mean, they filmed it all over the city to make it look deserted, to make it look like there weren't millions of people living here uh, for this film starring Again, Diana Ross and Michael Jackson. So today I am going to be showing you famous film locations from the movie uh, and you are to talk about the film locations. It is not about Michael Jackson. Uh, it is not about Diana, Diana Ross or the rest of the cast. You are more than welcome uh, to show your love for these iconic performers uh, after we're done. Uh, but this is about the icons, uh, the iconic monuments that are featured in these famous bits from the movie. Now I will tell you what the monument is just in case uh, it's not clear from the image Image I show you. Um, but uh, there is also a twist as we move into this round. My contestants, you may have realized there were no distractions in round one, right? No? Well, <laughs> this time AJ is shaking up the game. So AJ, uh, do you want to go and tell them the twist for round two? Hey guys, there's going to be a little bit of noise and you're also going to have a very antsy guest on your tour that might want to speak out and ask questions. Very well, sir. 
And we need a hamster. Uh, fantastic, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so thank you, AJ. So uh, beware of that. You will be judged on that. There is also a bonus question at the end of this round. Um, but we are shaking it up and we are going backwards. So Jason, you were last, last round. Uh, you are first up in round number two. Are you ready to see your iconic film location from The Wiz? Wonderful. Yeah, I'm ready. Cool. So ladies and gentlemen, here we go. Now you will notice that is Michael Jackson standing in front of the cyclone at Coney Island. Now you can talk about Coney Island, you can talk about the cyclone, um, but I have two minutes on the clock and whenever you're ready, Jason, we can go ahead and begin. You're, you're muted. Okay. All right, there we go. Um, okay. So I have personally been to Coney Island a few times. Uh, her famous birthplace of uh, Nathan's hot dogs. And uh, as someone who hates roller coasters, I didn't quite go to the amusement park at Coney Island, but I did discover one of my favorite places in Brooklyn, which is Brighton Beach, which is right next to uh, Coney Island. And Mr. Brighton Jason, Beach. Mr. Jason, how do you yes. get to Coney Island? Uh, from Times Square, you can take the Q train all the way down there. Um, you can also take the B train on weekdays when it's running. Um, B train's a little bit faster because it runs express. Um, but if it's a weekend or anything like that, the best way to get down there is the Q. You can also take the F train. That train will take a, forever and a decade. I believe the D train also goes down there as well, but I typically uh, take the Q train. Um, and if you're looking for um, to get some beach time in, I would highly recommend uh, skipping on over to Brighton Beach or Manhattan Beach because they're a little bit less crowded than Coney Island. And they also have some of my favorite Russian and Ukrainian food that I've ever had uh, in the U.S. Um, due to the large uh, Russian-Ukrainian population down in Brighton Beach. But Coney Island, I know, is also known to be a very multicultural, historically, neighborhood. Um, all kinds of people have lived there. And uh, I just avoid the, the tourism crowds down there. But there's a very famous amusement park, I believe, like the only wooden roller coaster uh, in New York. But I, I'm not an amusement park guy. <laughs> I just know for the beach because I love the beach. And uh, that's all I know right now. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Jason. All right. So uh, I'm going to continue shaking up my judges here for a second. Uh, first up is going to be Tom Simonetti this round. So Tom, uh, go ahead and ask him a question about Brooklyn, Coney Island, the Cyclone, whatever. Oh, Coney Island. How I do adore myself some Coney Island time. I've been on that beach before. I've gone up and down that boardwalk as well. Um, and I have actually been um, on that roller coaster. Um, being that it is wooden, I had a back problem for about two days afterwards. Um, but isn't that what we do when things are made of wood? So anyways, um, but uh, what? Uh, there's no kids. Um, so anyways, um, Jason, number one, you did a great job when AJ came on and asked me that wonderful question to get down there. Um, uh, my uh, question would uh, be is, um, is, there, is there a famous um, parade that goes on or any famous parades that go on down there? Yes, no, the, the mermaid parade goes on down there. Awesome, thank you. You're awesome, welcome. thank you, Tom. Uh, next up, because I'm gonna surprise her. Oh, it's Miss Jara. I was not surprised by that. Uh, Jason, you yes. don't like roller coasters and taxis. What <laughs> happened in your childhood? I'm serious. I mean this lightheartedly, but I'm genuinely <laughs> concerned. Well, I, I have been on a roller coaster before. I was like nine years old. I went on Space Mountain in Disney World. I hated That's that. That's dope. Ugh. And I know, and then like eighth grade, like Hersey Park in Pennsylvania. And I went on like one like super like not even hilly roller coaster. And I hated that too. I just hate going super fast. I, I just don't like the sensation. I don't like going on swings anymore. Like, Do you drive? I just, yeah, I love driving. I drive fast. What? What? <laughs> I know it's weird. Not getting in your car. Okay. It's, it's different when you operate the vehicle. I, I promise you. Um, yeah, I'm control. <laughs> yeah, when you're controlling it, it's a different experience. All right, last yeah. but certainly not least, Ms. Val, what questions do you have about Brooklyn, Coney Island, Brighton Beach? It could be about Ukrainian and Russian food. It could be about anything. I have to unmute. Okay, so um, we want to ask questions not about the film because I have so many thoughts about the film. Uh, <laughs> Jason, have you seen the film? <laughs> I'm played the fifth. Okay. Um, you can, you can, I, if you want, I just wanted to. I'll, 
I'll more kindly ask a question about uh, Coney Island. So, and this is actually a question that applies to a lot of amusement parks around the United States. And I'm originally from Pittsburgh. So there's one there that has many similarities to Coney Island that comes to my mind. Um, so before Coney Island became its current modern day with like roller coasters and all kinds of rides, and new rides, old rides, fun houses, what were those patches of land often how did they often start out previously before roller coasters came to be on these amusement parks in the United States? Uh, you know, that's a really great question. Um, I believe, I'm just going to go on, on a limb here. I believe that before they were amusement parks that they were, were they like um, carnival locations or were they like um, circuses? That's just, that's just a guess. I, I have no idea. Um, Helen, do you have something to share? Because I feel like your, your face made it look like you knew something. Me? Are you talking to me? Yeah. Okay. I um I, I don't know, but like I, I, I know that Coney Island was a resort before, um, like in the you know turn of the century and early twentieth century. Uh, so it was like you know what we would call like I don't know like spa resort destination, you know, because it was kind of far away from the city at the time. And I, there's several of Diker Heights by one of these as well. These kind of places they developed because as a ferry went there, you know, from the city or a train, a tram, whatever at the time. And so they were like a place to go for, you know, maybe not vacation, but like we, what we call a spa resort type of stuff, whatever. So I know I've seen all the images of Coney Island before uh, current days where uh, there was like a big um, hotel slash, so what I mean, something like that, like a resort, you know, because yeah. at the time it was from the city. But I think it's been like a, an amusement park for a really long time though. So it that, has, yeah, yeah, like it has been, the century, right? Oh, so there yeah, some kind of amusement park since the late 1800s. Yeah, um, Island yeah. and has similarities to what in Pittsburgh is Kennywood Park. It was originally the Kenny family's woods. It was actually a patch of just land where they would picnic and have leisure activities like what you were talking about, going to the spa. Um, and then it also makes me think of Galveston where there's the pier in Galveston. And so at the end of the day, what they all share is this late, this um, turn of the 20th century push towards leisure activities for people of some kind of means. And so leisure yeah. became about being able to go to this destination for fun and play, whether it's Astro Land, Coney Island, Kennywood, the pier at Galveston, and they all had popped up between the late 1800s and about 1925 to 35. They have this similar um, impetus of when they were built. And I find that really fascinating because as a nation, we were seeking collectively this kind of um, playland culture and escapism. And I love that that's what so many of these music amusement parks have in common with their wooden coasters and such. Awesome. Well, thank you, Val. And thank you. Thank you, Jason. Now, next up is going to be uh, Miss Jen, uh, your second this round. Um, are you ready to see your film location from The Wiz? Yeah. Now I'm going to show it to you. Maybe. Oh, here we go. Now, this is uh, from the musical number Ease On Down the Road with Michael Jackson and Diana Ross. Uh, now, there are five of them in this picture, uh, but you only have to talk about one of them. Uh, this is the Chrysler Building. Now, uh, I have two minutes on the clock. Jen, when you're ready. Uh, yeah, can you imagine if we had five, Tony, or five Chrysler Buildings? Uh, yes, I'm ready. So the Chrysler Building, one of the first Art Deco buildings here in New York City, uh, was part of the whole race to the sky and it was racing with 40 wall street which was next to federal hall national memorial um they were both the two architects were bitter um enemies they used to be partners but uh, they split off went their separate ways and uh h craig severance was 40 wall street and william van allen was the chrysler building and they both kind of kept saying i'm going to be taller no i'm going to be taller so h craig severance said 40 Wall Street's going to be 925. And then, um, uh, sorry, <laughs> I saw the clock and I got all stopped. Um, and then, of course, William Van Allen said, fine, do your thing. And when 40 Wall Street opened up, he didn't know that they had secretly built a spire inside the elevator shaft. So after 40 Wall Street went up, Chrysler Building hiked up their spire, taking them Jen, higher than 925 feet. Yes. How tall is yeah. the Chrysler building? Uh, it's 1,046 feet tall. 
And that spire is what take it to that height. And then it became the tallest building. Um, 40 Wall Street held it for 11 days. Chrysler Building held it for 11 months. And then the empire topped it out. And they held it for much longer. But those chevrons, the half moons that you see up at the top, that's actually what the hubcaps looked like on a Chrysler in 1929 and 1930. And the lower gargoyles are what the hood ornament looked like on a Chrysler in 1929 and 1930. So this building is to really give you the feeling that when you saw it, you wanted to buy a car, a Chrysler to be exact. Fantastic, well, thank you, Jen. All right, first up in this round, uh, we're gonna go back to the very beginning, uh, is Dara. So there you go. What question do you have about the Chrysler building? If I wanted to visit the Chrysler building, could I get to the top? Is it accessible to the public? Are there tours? Is there admission? How do I get in it? Well, you cannot get to the top. It used to have an observatory, but after the empire opened up, they closed theirs because obviously the empire's observatory was higher. Um, and Mr. Chrysler actually put a men's club up there which ironically, he hated New York. And so he had a restroom up there and it was kind of his way of urinating on the city. Uh, but you can go into the lobby and see that. Uh, there's some beautiful murals up on the ceiling, which is uh, Edward Trumbull, a WPA artist, did uh, a mural there on the ceiling. Now, the security kind of, they're a little picky in there. So they have a little station cordoned off. So if you go in a big group, well, warn your people. Like if you're gonna go in a bunch of you, you can't just stand in the middle of the lobby. You have to go over to this the station, stanch on the off area. So uh, I would recommend maybe a couple of you go in, kind of take a look and then pass through the doors and just meet again outside because they don't like to see a bunch of people just gathered together. But you can okay. go in and see the lobby. Cool, thank you. Thank you, Dara. And I'm just going to announce this, and this is no slack on Jen because she's very well versed in the topic. Um, to, during this quarantine, they've actually announced that they're reinstalling uh, the observation deck on top of the Chrysler building. So sometimes oh, uh, tourists will actually be able to go to the top of it, but that is brand new information. So, um, all right. Next up, Miss Val. What question do you have about the Chrysler building? Well, because I like to tie everything to musicals, I wanted to ask you if you knew what famous musical references the Chrysler Building in a song lyric. Annie. Uh, yeah, most definitely Annie. And it's like, I want you to scrub this place until it shines like the top of the Chrysler Building. <laughs> it's a hard knock life. Thank you, Val. It is. Uh, it is. <laughs> and last but certainly not least, I have a feeling that Val actually just stole this question from Tom. She, I am snatched wigless right now, is what I am. <laughs> and I am so bald and it is so cold, I can't even tell you. But um, I'm going to actually really challenge you which orphan says it? <sighs> it's not Annie. No, it's no, not I Annie. Not um, God, I can't remember her name, but it's like, she's like the tomboy. The one that's the tomboy, if I remember correctly. Um, yeah, 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 I think, yeah. Awesome, awesome, it's been awesome, a while awesome. Since I've seen Annie. Um, I've, I've had, I, it took me a while to, uh, I love that musical and it's what when it made me want to move to New York when I was five. Mm -hmm. uh, it took me much longer than that to get here, but uh, I finally made it. Um, but when I was in third grade, you know, when you have those talent shows and mm -hmm. I wanted to sing tomorrow and I was so proud of myself and my brother and his friends were out in the audience laughing. Now, for all I know, they were probably laughing at something else, but I took it that they were laughing at me and I got really upset and I ran off the stage and I hated the song tomorrow for the longest time until I got cast in Annie and had to sing that song. And then I got cast in Annie again, and I was Frances Perkins and had to sing a solo in it. And I was like, God wants me to come to terms with this song. So now so I like it. When I was in third, when I was in third grade, I wanted to sing "Little Girls" of uh, the Miss Hannigan number, but they wouldn't let me for some reason. I don't know why. Um, you, you, are, you are forever my Miss Hannigan. When I produce the show, you get the first call. Um, wonderful. Well, thank you. Um, we do have another competitor uh, today. Is the battle royale? So we've gone a little bit longer than normal, ladies and gentlemen. Please stay with us. Uh, the episode continues. Um, so, Helen, uh, I have an iconic film location from The Wiz, uh, ready to show you. Are you ready to see it? 
Fantastic. So here we go. Uh, this one right here uh, is the entire main cast, Dorothy, Scarecrow, uh, Tin Man, and Lion, standing in front of the main branch of the New York Public Library. Now, I've got two minutes on the clock. Let me know when you're ready to start. Okay. Okay, here we go. Is it okay, so the New York Public Library, this is the main branch of the New York Public Library. It is still open today. It is free to visit. It is not a learning library anymore. There are, I think, 82 branches of the New York Public Library in all of the suburbs now, but this is the first site that started uh, uh, as being a library open to the public. And so I think it's 1930, I don't remember if it's 1911 or 1913, so uh, forget me, but it was part of the City Beautiful Movement. Uh, it is a beautiful, beautiful building uh, in the Bazaar style. Uh, close to Grand Central Station, and it is the same style and same era than Grand Central Stations. And so it was done on purpose to be really, really gorgeous, and, and it looked like a palace, it's a palace uh, uh, place. Uh, it was called actually the Palace of the People at the time. And it was found by the Tilden Trust and two uh, donated uh, library fund, I forget the name, the names are on the top of the library, there's three names on the library. And there's two lions on either side of the library, but I'm not shown here. And they do have names, they do have names. They're called Patience and Fortitude, which I love. If I ever have kids, it would be called Patience and Fortitude. Will not happen. Um, and, sorry? Are the I, lions inspired after the line from the Wiz? No, they were inspired much, much, much long earlier. They're inspired by neoclassical architecture and the symbol of stability and fortitude and, and so on. Uh, but basically, so this was uh, the, the, the first, uh, the start of the New York Public Library. You can go in there, it's free. When you enter, you see it's really palatial. Um, uh, it is, you know, bizarre, like a Renaissance style. And you can go up the stairs. So bizarrely, the main room, which is the Rose Room, that was... Uh, being fixed for many years, but has reopened re re now. Uh, it's a huge room. It's not at street level. Sorry, I, I heard the, the I have much more to say. Sorry. Fantastic. Well, maybe our judges will get it out of you as they ask their questions. So first up uh, to ask a question about the New York Public Library is Miss Val. Okay, so um, the original, this first one that we see pictured in the film, um, what is the name of the park where it sits? I don't think you said that if I did, I'm, if you did, I missed that time, yeah. No, very good, thank you, that's a good question. So we are now uh, at the crossroad of Fifth Avenue and then 42nd and 41st Street. And just behind the, the building of the New York Public Library, uh, there is a little park, it's called Bryant Park after Colin Bryant, who was both a poet and a politician. What? Yes, these exist. Yeah. And so like, okay. uh, and he was promoting parks. So that's why he gives his name. So it is actually a European style little park. Very, very cute, very small, but very European. Uh, long, long, long before that, these all of the site, including the site of the public library, all that, you know, between Fifth and Sixth Avenue, was uh, the site um, uh, of the reservoir that was alimenting New York uh, um, in um, um, in water, because New York had no running water. And so, at some point, that we and so to this day we import water from upstate New York is the same source, pretty much, um, and by aqueducts. And so, this was one of the main uh, sites of reservoir. It looked like a pyramid cut on the top basically and long 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 before that it was a military site and it was a site of course to enter uh, uh you know people who died from epidemics <laughs> mm -hmm. it has been cleaned up in the case and so now under Bryan park uh there it's hollow people don't know but it's underneath it's hollow and they have two at least two floors of the reserves part of the reserves of the new york public library with like big doors that open like this and stuff like that. And I think they have sites in New Jersey because they have so much, pretty much. Both because what's on display, so now it's just a reading and display library. They also have newspaper rooms and they have all kinds of events. They have movies, they have exhibitions, stuff like that. But you can go, you cannot borrow things anymore. You can go almost across the street. You have a regular branch of the library where you can get things and get DVDs and books and stuff. But this one, no, not anymore. Uh, but you can go on site and then they have special rooms. I know, we themed, you know, but that's, that's are for scholars. So you can make appointments if you're a scholar or a researcher to access, you know, like special books and stuff like that, they would bring it out for you. 
and then they have murals. And I mean, I can talk about the murals and uh, all kinds of stuff. Well, well we, we have and two more flooding. questions. So uh, thank you, Val. All right, next up, uh, Miss Dara, give it to us. Are guided tours allowed inside the public library? So no. Uh, I used to do tours <laughs> of 42nd Street that we would hand up in Bryan Park. And I used to bring some of my group because it's, it's open to the public, let's face it. You have to pass it to security, blah, blah. And they tolerated us for a while. I was not doing anything, you know, we were not being noisy or anything. And at some point, one day, somebody handed me a letter, you know, like a one page. Discreetly, they were very nice and very polite, saying that in future, you should, blah, 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 you know, ask permissions. Um, yeah. And so I think for private, if you're like with a couple of people, no problem problem right uh, but they were very polite and very nice about it and I, I, I did like many tools before they even said anything uh, and I didn't know I was you know I thought it was okay sure uh, yeah they totally have their own they all do have their own free tours uh, daily um, I don't know these days of course but like, so I, I I don't remember if it's daily or every other day or whatever um, where and you can just go and sign up you know and it's like from 11 to 12 or whatever and everybody can take it okay cool thank you I've had that question so many times so travelers take note thank you uh i've been kicked out of the library on several occasions um because i like to defy the rules uh so last but certainly not least is mr tom simonetti uh, which question do you have about the new york public library so um my question because i love a good library um you know my nickname when i'm on tour is bell uh from beauty and the beast but that's another story um but anyways um my favorite thing is that you talked about the lions. They're so cute, especially at Christmas because they do put a little wreath on both of them and they are so iconic. And I know I've taken a billion selfies myself or made my tour take selfies of me in front of it, um, uh, take pictures of me in front of those lions. But I wanna know, what were the, who was the mayor that helped in naming those lions? Now the mayor, there is a musical based off of him. Uh, and it tied for the best Tony Award. Tonight would have been the Tony Awards. Um, uh, with the best Tony Award for a show called The Sound of Music. So it was the one year that we had a tie. But anyways, I would love to know who that mayor is. I do not know uh, who <gasps> is Lion, actually. I'm sorry, I'm blanking completely. I can try to throw some names, uh, but I, I, I'm not sure. It's all good. Uh, it's our. It was our tiniest mayor, our smallest mayor. La His Guardia? name is. Yep, yeah, so Laguardia. Fiorella de Laguardia. I was going to say yeah. but that wasn't sure. Okay, yeah, so no, it's Fiorello. It's Fiorello. 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 Yeah. Fiorello. Fiorello. Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't. See, I didn't remember that. Did I, I, I totally kind of guess. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, thank you. Thank you, Tom. It's it's the one time in U.S. history that a famous Italian wasn't a mobster. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> ah. Sorry. And I can say that because my last name is as Italian as Tom's. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, uh, and our uh, contestants, we have, uh, like I said, one more chance for a bonus. It's the same kind of situation. I have a very hard image uh, from uh, this theme. So this category, uh, film locations from The Wiz. Uh, the first question is going to be where what is this film location, okay? I will show the image. You will all have an opportunity. We're gonna do the exact same thing as last time. So let me pull it up. <laughs> that is not the image. <laughs> All right, this is your last chance to win up to two bonus points. Uh, here is the film location from The Wiz. Now in the film, this is the Emerald City. Take a look, take a look. This is the Emerald City in the film. There will be two questions about it, but the first one is where or what is this film location? Uh, I'm gonna take the image away. And just so everyone has a fair playing field, hands down, <laughs> hands down everybody. And on the count of three, and my judges, I need you to watch to, to help me break any ties here. On Helen, hand down. There's a lag. There's a lag. Also, you have to come that. Everybody. Okay, I know. That. I know. All right. On the count of three. One, two, three. Okay. Well, Helen, got it. Okay. So for the first one, what uh, location in New York City was the Emerald City featured at? It is at the old World Trade Center. The, the, you know, World Trade Center as we know it. It was on the plaza of the World Trade Center. Fantastic. Fountain with like a bar. I, mean, I don't know if I should talk more or is that- No, 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 don't talk more. Because <laughs> uh, okay. you have another question. All right, so you did get uh, question one right, so that is one bonus point. Now the second question, and I will pull up the image, um, is, and you have to give the exact name. Uh, the Oz logo is located on a famous New York City monument that's actually still in the city today, just no longer located at the World Trade Center. What is the official name of that monument? 
so I'm sorry. Okay, so we're talking about the Z stuff, right? Yes, that was added from the movie, but it's so on. It is from where movie. it yeah. is where the sphere uh, uh, used to be. Yeah, which, uh, yeah, uh, which is a, a, a sculpture that has been damaged during the event of 9/11, and it's it was it at a uh, um, um, battery park for a long time, and now it's back to it's not on the the memorial, but it's just out of the memorial in the little uh, uh, garden that's just outside of the memorial. So. Fantastic. Well, uh, that is an additional bonus point for you. So you just won two. All right. Now, um, our judges, uh, or Dara, is going to be tabulating uh, who the winner is. Uh, I'm going to vamp for just a second, and we're almost done, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so like I've said, today was kind of a themed episode based on everything that's happening in New York City. Round one uh, were just several of the famous uprisings that have happened in history. Uh, there have been many of them, ladies and gentlemen. So uh, if you're out there and you're interested in some of the things we talked talked about. Um, there are movies, some of them better than other movies like The Gangs of New York, which is not a musical yet. I haven't had my chance. Uh, newsies, uh, things like that hair uh, to talk about some of these famous uprisings, um, but we've had a lot of them. Uh, and if you haven't seen The Wiz, um, I think there has never been a better time to do that. Uh, not only are Michael Jackson and Diana Ross fantastic in the movie, um, it is just as every bit as good as The Wizard of Oz. Uh, they are beautiful companion pieces to each other. Uh, do Watch the original, NBC's live version, Maybe watch that later on, uh, but watch the original film uh, produced back in 1975, 75, 78. Um, all right, do we have a winner yet? Let me go ahead and take a look. Uh, drum roll, please. All right, and this is by a hair, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the winner of the Battle Royale for the title of New York City's Best Tour Guide and the winner of a $100 Visa gift card is Brrr, Jen Andres. Everyone, please give her a round of applause. And it was very close. It was actually very close across the board. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you, Jen. Thank you, Helen. Thank you, Jason, for joining us. Jason, please take care of yourself and please give us an update uh, after you find out what's going on with you tomorrow. Uh, Jen, please make sure you connect with Dara at the end of the episode uh, so that you can get both of your prizes. Uh, and same thing for Helen and Jason. Thank you, everybody. Uh, we will be doing uh, a Pride episode coming up. We are just still working out the dates, um, but it will be a completely uh, LGB filled cast, LGBTQ plus filled cast of allies, uh, all the spectrum of the alphabet soup that is our community. Uh, so stay, stay tuned, we will announce it on Facebook. Bye everybody, have a great day.